Today, we're gonna to unpack what in the world do you do with all the measurement data? How does it affect and inform the decisions we make as systems engineer? But first, I wanna let you know about my super secret scary sale. You can get my flagship workshop from Chaos to Clarity, a system tuning workshop for beginners, 31% off from now until Halloween. It's the biggest sale I've done since launching the course. Excited to share it with you. Anywhere in this YouTube video is gonna be the coupon code. So you gotta find it, put it in, that the link below will bring you to the sales page, you can either pick the standalone workshop or the bundle with my Making Sense of Sound course. Either one is going to be 31% off. So maybe you've getting pretty good about capturing measurements and open sound meter or smart. You're starting to work on some more systems and you're like, I get the microphone. I, I'm kind of getting able to read the data, but how do I couch this within a proven workflow to actually work on any sound system? And that's what we cover in the system tuning workshop, how to plan, how to verify, how to process, and how to listen and make changes. So make sure and snag that at the link below. Again, anywhere in this YouTube video is gonna be the coupon code. So you gotta find it, put it in. It's good through October 31st, 2023. Hope you check it out. Let's jump in. Today we're covering what do you actually do with all the measurement data that we collect? We know learning a software like Smart or Open Sound Meter or Rita and getting this data for sound systems is important, but how does that actually help us make decisions and get better results out of our systems? Because when we're tuning a system, we're actually doing three jobs at once. And it's similar to how the medical industry works here when we maybe break your arm. So an x-ray tech is responsible for capturing images of your arms. You walk in and say, hey, I fell on it at the skate park like I do, and I think I've broken it. They're gonna make sure and take high quality images or capture data about your arm. And then they're gonna hand those off to a radiologist. It's their job to be able to look at those high quality images, interpret what happened. Like, hey, your bone was supposed to be this way, and now it's going that way, something is wrong, right? So they're interpreting that data. And then they say, hey, it broke someone is gonna to have to fix it, and that is a surgeon. They're able to correct the data. So they're using their tools and expertise to know like, hey, this is broken. Here's the best core for action to bring it back into alignment and get it back into a good spot. So we're doing all of those things. So on site, we are capturing data about a sound system. It's all these squiggly lines. And then we're supposed to interpret and see what it means. Is it quality data? And then use those to make decisions about how we should align a system. So. First off, data helps us answer questions and inform decisions. If you remember just one sentence from today, is that is what it's there for. So what that means is every time you capture a measurement, you should have a question to answer or a decision to make. So not just putting a microphone out there willy nilly, just out in the middle of the floor. What specific question do we wanna answer and what specific decisions, what do we wanna make? So again, what questions are worth asking is, is what it follows from that. And then what decisions are worth making. Okay, let me give you some examples of that. And the first category of that is verification. So this is the unsexy part of system tuning. But if you don't get this right, nothing else will follow. So the first verification question you might ask is, are my measure microphones working correctly? So here's a picture from a uh, verification and tuning I did this year uh, at a church. And believe it or not, there's a speaker up in this little box up here. And the first thing I do is put all four of my measurement microphones in roughly the same spot in the room and take a measurement. And the thing is, I need to make sure they're all working. So that means if they're all in agreement, that means they are all really similar. So microphones might have differing sensitivities, and so we might need to adjust preamp game to get them to all match, but this is the measurement I got at that point in the room with all four microphones, and this is the data that shows. They're all overlapping in both phase response and magnitude response, so I know that they are trustworthy. So they're tracking very similar on frequency response, so I know I can trust the data I get as I move them throughout the room. As you can see up top, there's a little bit of difference here in the phase response, and I probably could have got it overlapping better if I really fine-tuned uh, the measurement delay applied there. So, so mic verifying decisions is I might need to adjust the preamp gain on the microphones to get them to match. Uh, I might be using differing microphones, so maybe a DBX measurement microphone, it has uh, its pins are wired backwards. So you might have to invert the polarity to get it match your other microphones. You might need to replace the cable if it's not trustworthy or replace the microphone. So those are all decisions about making sure we have the right gear that we need to make. Another verification decision to make is this speaker working correctly. Once we make sure microphones are working correctly, data can help us make sure of that. 
So a good way to do that is to get near field data. So this is a K12 with the microphone really close to it, about three feet and six feet away from it. So now I'm going to compare two measurements. This green trace is actually that same K12 speaker in an anechoic chamber, which is really cool, meaning no reflections, no noise, very quiet. As we can see from the red line at the top right here, it's you can barely see it because it's all the way at the top. That means it's near 100% coherence, meaning it's really trustworthy data. And there's also not much ripple at all. And a lot of reason we see ripple in the data is from noise or reflections. So it's a very clean impulse response. It has very high coherence and very little ripple. So this is a really great measurement. Flipping over to this purple trace, this is the same speaker, but it's outside, there's walls, uh, and it's trending along a similar path, but you can see the coherence isn't amazing, but it's still worth capturing. So I actually got these measurements from Tracebook, and it's, a, it's an open source library of measurements you can get. So you can take measurements of your own speakers and upload it. That's how I'm able to compare an anechoic measurement of a third party user in the field versus just the data that QSC gives us who makes the K12 versus something else. So anyway, even if you have an anechoic chamber versus just taking a measure of something in the room, it's still worth it so we can verify that. So that's something data can help us do. This is also a bunch of measurements of, I think, 24 different RCF HDL6As. They were all in a stack and I quickly verified that they were all working. Ideally, I placed them all on the floor like I did that K12. You can see there's a lot of variation due to ground bounds and path lengths, but they're all tracking really similarly. So just to show you what a bunch of data looks like here of the HDL6A. So the decisions we need to make about speaker verification is we need to troubleshoot the signal flow. So are we getting a single speaker that looks different from all the rest? So can we make sure the signal flow is right all the way from the console to the DSP to the speaker? We may, might need to repair or replace the speaker, or maybe we need to have something up there and just use, use some EQ to overcome some damage control with something with the speaker. So those are all decisions we can make from that data, but knowing how to read it and know what it's telling us is of utmost importance. Okay, so moving on from verification to investigation, this is the actual, in, in my mom, more the tuning or alignment process, but one of the biggest questions we are asking is what is the level and tonal difference front to back? Remember, one of our entire jobs as system engineer is to make it sound the same in every seat. We can't control how good the mix is, how good the band is, but we can control coverage and making sure we have the same similar levels and tonality in every seat. And some of that may flex depending on the goals of the client or the venue shape, but in general, that's a really important metric for us. So here's a recent show I was on. It was actually in a, inside a, uh, a rodeo arena. And I had these, I think it was nine boxes of HDL 6As or maybe 10 up there in the air and they're covering off to the side. So here's another picture viewing from the stand. So I had bleachers all along, it was about 200 feet wide and I had to cover all of that with the speaker, with uh, those line arrays and I covered on the floor right here in front with these K12s. So here is the design. So I'm using these receivers right here to simulate what the front to back difference is gonna be. And I've placed them here right in the middle of these zones. I made an A zone, at the very top right here, a B zone and a C zone. So A is the middle of that box going here, uh, excuse me, right here. Woo. And then the other one coming here to the middle and the bottom. So it's a simple way by placing a microphone front to back to see what that level of difference is. So before I got out in the field, I had to see like, okay, what does this look like in the design? And these, these are each of those three spots. Again, the blue being the very front, green in the middle and the red at the back. And with the given trim height I had in the boxes uh, that were there, this is the best I was able to get it. And so if I can click on this middle trace, I can actually show the delta from the middle and look at the front microphone and the rear microphone. Um, so it's about 13 dB here at 100 Hertz. It's about a 7 dB delta from front to back at 1K and it's 11 dB delta at 10K. So. I would think as much as I went back to the drawing board of my design, this is as close as I was gonna get it. And let's see how it actually translated in the field. So the top trace is each of those same three microphone positions. So what was encouraging is that in the field, things tracked a lot closer than it did in the design, part of it due to the room acoustics and some other factors, but uh, this was at pre-EQ. So as my goal to get those traces to be as similar as possible. So this is with no trace offsets. These are just the microphones as they were. So what can I do? 
So what are the decisions I need to make with this data? Well, previously you see this white trace. This is my target curve. So this is what I want to get the traces to align to. That's my starting point for most PAs. And then I can walk around and listen to reference tracks and make decisions from there. But my goal is to get all these three, the pink, the green, and the orange line to be similar to the white. And what's the best tool for adjusting that? It's going to be EQ. But I earlier I spoke about these three separate zones, the A, B, and C, I'm going to tackle those after I adjust the macro tonality of the system. So that's the level and total difference decisions are going to make. And the first one is going to be macro EQ. So this is the EQ I cr applied across the entire hang, that right hang there, all boxes. So let's see what it looks like before and after. So I took this low mid bump down here, and uh, the general lack of 2K here, and I applied that, and this is after. So you can see all these are tracking much closer to this trace, and I opted to have this a little bit lacking in the low end since it was a lot of dialogue-based stuff. Uh, I didn't need quite that much, but as you can see here, the traces are tracking really similar to each other until they start to break apart uh, on that front box here at about 5K. All right, so then I wanted to be able to take that bottom zone, that zone C, like I mentioned earlier, these bottom two boxes and shade them down. Since they have separation in the high frequencies, there's no overlap. Again, I see that big uh, spike in top end there and I can use a high shelf to bring that down. So I brought it down about five dB and this is after high frequency shading before and after. So pay attention to this uh, purple or magenta trace right here was here and now it's much lower. So now then tonality front to back is really similar. And this goes up without saying, but the level is really similar too. Again, there's no trace offset. They're not normalized at any point. This is the actual level front to back from uh, something that's only about 30 feet away to almost 120 feet away, which is pretty cool. So uh, another question you can answer is how effective is my cardioid subarray? So when deploying a cardioid subarray, the point of it is to make sure more energy is going out into the audience and less onto the stage. So this is a uh, simple inline gradient cardioid subarray. This is two subs in front of each other. It's about a four foot, two inch spacing. And I was testing this out here in the shop. And a way to test its efficacy is to put a measurement microphone about six feet in front of this woofer, this acoustic center, and then put another one six feet behind it. So that's what I did. And then I'm able to measure the delta. What's the difference? So this data told me at the front, it was at that level here at the magenta line, then at the back, it's this orange line. So I could see here, especially in the mid band of the, the subwoofer, I have a 14 dB delta. So when looking at this 14 dB delta, I know that 12 dB is the same thing as a 4X increase or one quarter of what it was, or so a little bit more than that. So about a fifth uh, of the energy at the rear than at the front, which is pretty darn cool. So some other questions that we might need to ask is if I'm adding delay speakers, how much do we need to delay them? And that is measurement data that we can get of seeing the delta between two different speaker sets arriving at the same point. Uh, or my front fills too loud when they're able to use level data and match the tonality of those speakers at a given point when our front fills are handing off to our mains. Or, or are these two differing subs phase compatible? So when marrying maybe a turbo sound sub with a QSC sub, can I put them and have them work together and not fight each other? And that's all up to the phase response. We mainly looked at magnitude uh, today, not phase, but all of this data sets informs and helps these decisions when we are tuning. So again, this might feel a little overwhelming to you to think about I'm making all these sorts of decisions. I have to be all three of these parties of capturing data, interpreting data, and uh, correcting things as I see fit from the data. I mean, what order should you take these measurements in? Should you EQ or timeline your fills first? How do I fill systems incorporate into my mains? How much processing is too much? Uh, how do I make this happen in a system processor? How do I know when I'm done? And I'm happy to share with you that I've got all this packaged up in from Chaos to Clarity, a system tuning workshop for beginners. It introduces you to a four part framework that's strategy, not just more tactics. As much as I love my YouTube channel, getting to share things from the field and all these workflows, this gives you a proven step-by-step -step workflow to put it all together. Uh, I'm sure a lot of this is still covered in some way in what I've done here on YouTube already, but not packaged up in this linear fashion with the exact steps you need to take. And not only is it just prescriptive, um, 
I guess I'm not trying to be prescriptive, but to teach you how to think about making these by dividing up the task into this planning phase, verification, processing, and listening. And like I said at the beginning, I'm running a super secret, scary sale. You're getting 31% off either the workshop or the workshop bundle with my Making Sense of Sound course. Uh, then that's good until 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time, October 31st, 2023. So I'll have that at the link below. Make sure and snag it. So yeah, today I wanted to introduce you uh, to the fact that measurement data is really important, but it has to be couched within a workflow to make sense of it. And I hope this workshop will help you do that. My name is Michael Curtis. Thank you so much. Make sure and snag the course at this one-time discount. Catch you next time.